Hey everyone, this is Nick from NXC Plants. Today I'm going to be going over how you can make your anthurium look like mine. So that means I'm going to go through all my care. Okay, well I think I'm just going to hold a pretty plant while I talk a little bit about the conditions I grow under. So I think first thing I want to mention is there's a new kitten and <laughs> the first thing I want to talk about are the total general conditions I keep my anthurium. So to start off with, dress the elephant in the room, I'm sitting in front of my grow tents. Um, I, I did start out growing my anthurium without grow tents, but once I got the first one and I moved my anthurium in, I sort of realized just how much of a difference they can make. And if you are looking to get a grow tent, I highly recommend Facebook Marketplace. I would highly recommend that. Um, that's how we got our first tent and you know paid a fraction of retail for a, a, a very good quality tent. Yeah, so the reason I like the high humidity is it just makes everything sort of a lot easier. Uh, my tents sit at about 80%, sometimes 85. On the drier days, it can be down to 76, especially if the temperature's going up a lot. So that is, you know, not the craziest amount of humidity. I do keep some of my smaller plants and props in bins and the humidity in bins, I'm just gonna go grab one. The second place where I like to grow a lot of my smaller plants, my seedlings, propagations alike, are in these clear bins here. So I keep them on a shelf, and they work great for the sort of small to almost medium-sized plants before you want to graduate them to the tent. The reason I really like the bin humidity is if you have a plant that has no roots or is struggling with roots, the humidity is high enough in here that the plant won't dehydrate. So it's able to really just grow based off of the ambient moisture in the air. Um, yeah. It also works really great for some of the more challenging species for people, like Cunega lens. Um, I've also got a Dresslerai in this bin, and of course some of my more cloud foresty anthurium in these bins, that's things like the Lapoenum, the Debilis, which isn't a cloud forest but it has similar needs. The Splendidum, again, not a cloud forest, but has similar needs. The SP Purple, these ones that require the really, really high humidity and ideally a little bit cooler temperatures, I like to keep in the bins. Just makes everything a little bit easier. Once the plants are bigger, you can work on transitioning them out, but when they're small and your, you know, your margin for error is so tiny, I do like the bins. Oh, let me show another pretty plant while well, I have this bin here for you. This is my RG number no. two XL from Grant. Very pretty. I'm starting to enjoy this plant as it's getting its color, growing good in these bins. Once you graduate a plant from these bins, I like to keep them in the grow tents. The grow tents work great because, you know, they're a little bit, they're one step down in humidity, but they're a significant improvement from your just sort of average living conditions. Another reason I like the grow tents is it lets me keep all of that moisture, dirt, whatnot in one contained space. So I keep my tents between um, 75 and 85% humidity. I do like to open them out up every day to let air in. But other than that, they are sealed. There's no vents or anything. I know that might be a bit of a privilege of my climate and for everyone else out there that won't be possible just due to your temperatures and conditions. But for me, I do keep my tents closed and I just open them once per day to let fresh air in. And let's be honest, I have to go in them at least once a day. Yeah, other than that, I run one small fan. You can see it right there. And that I do keep running 24 seven. And the lights I run for 14 hours a day. So in this tent here, the neutral light color you see coming down from above, that's a Fluval planted 3.0 aquarium light. I had it left over from a fish tank and I've really enjoyed it in this tent here. It's like a 40 watt um, full spec LED and you can actually set the light temperature really easily. So I have it set to sort of a, a, the color of sunlight. I would totally recommend it if you want a very customizable light. It's just, it's a little bit expensive because you can individually play with each of the colors, which is, uh, and it's a really like nice waterproof light because it's four aquariums. But then on the sides here, this is gonna be a little bit in view, but I have, I'm gonna grab one from the closet. Yeah, but then for other supplemental lighting in this tent and all of the lights I use in this tent and above the humidity bins I showed you on my shelving, I use these 10 watt LED bars from Barina. I'm not a big fan of the purple color, uh, but it, they work great and they were, uh, you know, very affordable. Some of these are going on two years old and they still work great. One thing I will note is the older they get, the more purple they get. And it happens pretty quickly. Like I noticed because I put up fresh ones in the top of this tent to make some higher, life, higher light shelves for Monstera and Hoya. And the fresh bar next to the 
uh, probably six month old bar from the same pack. It was just like such a noticeable color difference. It looked almost white in comparison. So that's just another thing to keep in mind if you do go this route. And yeah, as I was saying, I don't really have that much airflow in either tent and the bins obviously don't have any airflow. And you'll notice even on something like an Ace of Spades, I'm not really having fungal issues. And I attribute a lot of that to my feed regimen more so than, more than the, uh, you know, the airflow or something like that. Even on other plants that I normally struggle with fungal issues, I found once they start getting fed, most of those issues go away. And I've seen that uh, quite frequently in seedlings before I'm fertilizing, they might have some spotting or other fungal issues in the high humidity. But once they start getting fed, you know, that obviously resolves. Just my two cents on the whole, you know, airflow needs of these velvet leaf anthurium. Even in high humidity, it's really not, a ne not necessary for me in my growing environment. Before we stop talking about conditions, I wanna just talk about what my experience was growing in ambient conditions. So that was here in Vancouver Island, you know, on my kitchen counter, essentially. Growing under those conditions, I found, like, it worked. I kept some of the, my starter ones, you know, like Queen, Crystallinum, um, you know, Crystal Mags, Clarinarium, all those without really any issue on the counter. And the big thing I found was making sure I kept the reservoirs full in the pots and that kept them pretty happy, I think. From what I experienced, it seemed like as long as the roots stay nice and moist and humid, the plant is relatively happy to grow at you know surprisingly low humidity levels. So I just thought I would throw that in there. So my recommendation would totally be doing some sort of self-watering setup if you were going to be growing the anthurium and ambient, just to make your life a lot easier. Next section is lighting. I know this is a very controversial subject, especially among people who like to have very dark foliage on their anthurium. I'm a little bit out there and I do use a bit more light than a lot of what people say. And let me just like pull up some plants and talk about the different levels they're growing at. This plant is, you know, a Anthurium carlobachiae. It's an RA5X RA10. Um, I definitely get a lot of compliments on this plant, uh, especially with how dark its foliage is. Since we're talking about lighting, let me talk about the level I keep it in. I keep it in about 700 foot candles, 120 PPFD. These are full spec. It's mostly getting full spec LED. Um, gets a little bit of the burino. See, it's getting pretty good light. And the foliage is still quite dark. You could totally dial it back. I know a lot of people recommend, based off of, I believe it was Javen E, who said about 80 uh, PPFD for the super dark velvety leaves ones to get that ideal color. I'm pretty happy with a little bit higher than that. And that's just to keep things growing fast. Once they're big plants, I do move them into more like 80. And that's what I'd say like, oopsies, I'm gonna break an inflow off. That back area where the paps and the ace live, it's definitely more like 80. Um, but when they're small like this, it's really good to just get them lots of light so they grow nice. And another nice thing about giving them the strong light from the front is you can bring all the leaves forward and it makes a very attractive looking plant. So two things, two more things I want to mention about lighting. The way I recommend you figure out the lighting requirements or wants for your plant, I'm gonna have a cat fly at my face to try and swap these inflows, one sec. Uh, the way I like to think about it is once you're feeding your plant, you know you have all the right ingredients there to make the color pigments. If you're still seeing bleaching, and uh, if you're still seeing bleaching, start stepping back the light a little bit. You know, you still see bleaching, step it back a little bit more until you just don't really see it. And I think an important thing to remember is it can take a long, a long time after the leaf hardens for the color to fully come in and it might still look a little bit washed out. I like to say almost until the next leaf is finished, a lot of times the color can continue to darken, especially on things like the Carla, the Ace of Spades, and the Paps. I notice that a lot that it really takes until the next leaf has come out for the color to really fully be there. And like I said, once you dial in your light, I like to sit just under where I get a little bit of bleaching. I can totally get the colors on even a plant like this just a touch darker if I were to lower the light some more. However, I like to keep it up at a bit of a higher light. I always worry that, you know, maybe a, a new leaf will grow in on a different plant and block it and then suddenly it won't have enough light and it'll get root rot. I haven't had that issue, it's just, I'm sure, some paranoia, but that's just my thoughts on it. I like to keep the light levels a little bit higher. One last thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about lighting is the law of squares. So let me explain. 
if I have my plant you know, one foot away from the light, and I now move it two feet away from the light, you'd think maybe it's getting now half the light. It's actually going to be getting 75% less, less light than it was getting before when it was at, you know, uh, that little bit closer. So just keep in mind, it, the light intensity drops off a lot more than you'd expect as you increase the distance. And one last thing, I did want to talk about the varieties of anthurium that I think do want a bit higher light. And when I say a bit higher light, I mean more like 1500 foot candles. That would be the Anthurium moraquinum, the Wenlingri, the Pallidiflorum. I'm going to start experimenting with the uh, SP Morona as well. Just my experience with the pendant Anthuriums. I had a Vitarfolium and I also kept that one at very high light. They seem to size up rapidly and they really appreciate the quite strong light by Anthurium standards. Um, and that also goes for the Queen, which I know isn't technically a pendant Anthurium. I do think it likes the really high light as well. And it just helps, it seems to help the plant size up nicely and my queens are been, my, I say queens, I used to have two, but I chopped one up because it got too big. But my other, my, uh, my re remaining queen, it flowers constantly for me and it throws leaves at a pretty good pace and they're getting, I think, close to, they're past three feet, so they're, they're quite huge by, they're quite huge, which is just really nice to have. So, would definitely recommend increasing the light for your queens, pendant anthurium. Fun thing, it'll actually make your palette of florum a little bit narrower, at least that's my experience. The next section I want to talk about is anthurium substrates and sort of the different things I grow my anthurium in and why I would pick, you know, one substrate or the other and how I came to develop the mixes I use. I think to start off with, I'm going to talk about my pawn and I, I call it pawn, it's just a, you know, inorganic mineral substrate made up of four parts perlite, two parts pumice, two parts lava rock, one part fluval stratum. I sort of developed this as an alternative to Lechuza Pond, just because I the little bit I used I found a bit heavy and it was expensive and somewhat difficult to source. So I wanted to create a pond recipe I could make locally with my what was available to me. And I wanted to include the different products that I had found sort of beneficial. Uh, one of them, you know, being fluval stratum. I, so when I started my anthurium journey, I definitely used quite a bit of it. I had experience with it in fish tanks, but, uh, and transitioning into the plant hobby, I found it really great for growing, especially small plants. So starting off there, I was diluting it with perlite and whatnot. And then out of that process, I sort of developed this pond recipe to use the absolute minimum amount of fluval, because it's not the cheapest. Um, while still maintaining a lot of the benefits of the fluval and the other things for, um, you know, rooting and whatnot. I use this for everything from seeds to large plants. I mean, it works great. Let me, let me hold it up so you can get a look at it. Hold this up to the camera. See, it's just like a nice, it's not even that coarse. And I find it works absolute wonders. I get great fluffy roots. And one of the nice things about it is it sits wet, but it's still very airy. And that seems to be the magic combination for these anthurium. And I like to keep lots of different things in them. I don't use pawn in these big black pots. And that's just because the net pot portion has holes that are bigger than the size of my substrate particles or particulates. So I don't want to deal with the mess of that sort of settling in and until it holds its shape. So I just, I don't use it in that. See, get it up there. You can see what the texture of it looks like. Yeah, I've been using it now for over two years. And before that, I just used a chunky aeroid mix. Big reason I like the pond and all and my other mixes is I'm able to grow everything in self-watering pots. So that's just a pot with a reservoir component and then wicks. And that lets them hold a you know, I'll just say a month's worth of water, or in this case, nutrient solution, and holding all that, it makes watering a lot easier. So from what I need from my substrates is the ability to constantly be sitting wet without going anoxic. That's where, that was, that was the uh, need, and this is how I sort of answered that need and developed it. I started off using, um, you know, just the online pumice, lava rock, zeolite, mix that a lot of people use for their pond. Through development and a little bit of trial and error, I found the little bit lighter, the, the lightness of the perlite and the other ingredients and ratios 
and mine I found works a little bit better for anthurium roots. So let's talk about why I'd put a plant in pond versus why I'd put it in tree fern. It's entirely cost. Uh, if I know a plant could do okay in either, I would probably put it in pond. If I know it's a little more challenging of one or a slower grower, I do prefer the tree fern. And that's just because I found some plants to be intolerant of pond and other plants to be, and I have, I've yet to find a, an anthurium that doesn't like the tree fern mix. Uh, and I don't know, just sometimes like I grow a lot of hybrids and a lot of duplicate hybrids and I'll sometimes have one of the hybrid not like pond and just constantly be rotting its roots over and over and over again. But if I put it in the tree fern mix, suddenly it's fine and it's growing again. And the rest of its siblings, you know, are still fine being in pond. So sometimes it just comes down to the individual plant and I haven't quite worked out why, but that's just been my experience. So since I haven't had anything ever reject the tree fern, especially with the more sensitive or expensive plants, I do like to just put them straight into tree fern instead of doing the pond. And that's just out of, you know, a fear of them rejecting the pond for whatever reason, where, like I said, never had anything reject the tree fern. So let's talk about the tree fern. I have two different types of tree fern mixes. So I have my tree fern mix here, which is tree fern and then pumice and perlite until it looks like a good ratio. I know that's not exact. I know, I know. But I, I don't know. I feel like everyone has that ratio they feel is right. And for me, that was that sometimes batch specific, which isn't a great way to do things, but it's just how it is. And I like this for smaller cuttings and seedlings. So let me go grab a seedling tray. Since I mentioned it, talking about my tree fern, pumice, and perlite mix for small plants and seedlings. So that's what I use in my seedling trays here. Just show you this tray here. I'm trying not to spill water, but yeah. So the, what they're growing in is just a mix of tree fern, perlite, and pumice. And that work, seems to work great. I just keep a little bit of water in the bottom and I try to make sure it never goes dry dry. And then, you know, I'll fertilize starting at about this size here. And that's just because at this size, they're starting to show nutrient deficiencies on the next leaf if I am not starting to supplement some of the nutrients. But yeah, I like the pumice, tree fern, and perlite mix for the small plants and cuttings. And that's just because they tend to be in smaller containers and the bark pieces will take up too much volume in that container, so I omit them from the mix. The last substrate I use is but I think in my previous video I called my big boy mix. And that is equal parts tree fern, um, orchid bark, and my pawn. The reason I use my pawn is it's already mixed up usually and already mixed up washed and it has, you know, a little bit of everything. If I was to make it from scratch, I probably wouldn't put in the black lava rock, but otherwise I would put all the other components in. And then to that I add up to 2% by weight biochar. I usually just eyeball it. It's a powder and I make sure I don't use too much. And then I also like to add kelp powder to that. So that's just kelp that's been incinerated and powdered. Um, reason I add that last part is it's really good for stimulating root growth. Um, when you put into the new mix, and a lot of my plants are going from pond into the tree fern mix. So I like having the kelp powder in there to stimulate root growth while they're in the transition phase. I need to make soil. But Hopefully you can get an idea for the particulate size. No, not the chunkiest mix, but anthurium like to be moist, so the finer mix works great for them. Next up, I want to talk about water and watering. I think one thing that people underestimate is the impact of chlorine and chloramine on the, especially appearance of your anthurium. A lot of the ringing around the edge can be caused by the chlorine, chloramine, and other impurities in your water. So. I'm very fortunate. My tap water has about seven parts per million, just straight out of the tap. It does, however, still contain chlorine and chloramine. So what I do is I just run it through a very basic like charcoal pitcher filter. Um, and that does a good job getting rid of the chlorine and the chloramine. It doesn't get rid of all of it, but since my tap water is pretty dang close to RL water, I don't really bother doing any heavier filtering. Um, that being said, I would love to eventually get a barrel set up with a reverse osmosis thing, sort of like what saltwater fish tank people do. And that's just because I go through like 30 gallons of nutrient solution a month. <laughs> There's a kitten, I don't know if you can see him. But that requires a lot of filtering 
So I mean, it, it's not that much work to just, you know, fill up the big thing that uh, drains through, but it's a little bit annoying. So it'd be nice to have it just running in the background. If you live somewhere with uh, not the greatest water, definitely make sure you're filtering it. It can help. Not every anthurium is going to need it. A lot of them are very hardy and won't show any signs, but some of the more pain in the ass ones definitely will notice the difference between filtered water and unfiltered water. And lastly, if you are, let's talk about watering. So like I was saying before, I like a substrate that can sit. Yeah, and like I was saying in the substrate section, when it comes to watering, try to think of your anthurium substrate as being able to be watered every day. That's how chunky and airy it should be. But it should also like be moist every day. It's a bit of a hard combo to nail, but once you can nail it, you know, I like doing it through self-watering, but if you're like a die-hard waterer and you can make a good chunky mix that never dries out to the point that your anthurium are angry, all power to you. I've just built a care schedule that works for me in my environment, and for me that looks like a self-watering pot with a nutrient solution <laughs> reservoir. So yeah, let's talk about what my watering looks like. I showed a little bit before, and bring this into frame, and then I'm gonna carry it out of frame because I have space here. This is what I mix my nutrient solution in. It is a it is a five gallon jug, and it has this uh, little battery powered pump. I usually leave it plugged in, but I found three pushes of it are about is about one gallon. So when I'm swapping out my reservoirs, I take a, an empty pot, and I take my plant. So I take a bucket. I take my plant I'm wanting to swap the reservoir on, you know, in this case, beautiful king of spades. I lift the net pot out, set it on here. I dump this bucket of nutrient solutions. This would be the one month old reservoir. Take that, dump it down the drain. And I put, you know, three pumps from that five gallon jug into the black pot and I put the plant back. Um, I like to pour a little filtered water on top just to wet everything. I don't think it does anything, but that is something I do. And that's that's it, once a month. That's the extent of my water. All I have to do is dump the reservoir and then fill it back up with about a gallon. Another tool I use while watering is this spray bottle. And it's just the sort of thing you pressurize and it has a wand attachment and it's really great for spot watering or the smaller things. You know, obviously I don't want to spray a gallon through that because it'd be very annoying to pressurize the bottle. For the small stuff, it works great and for watering these little square pots while you're in a tent, it's super handy. I know I kept emphasizing the importance of making sure your anthurium don't dry out, and that's just because when we look at the environments these anthurium come from, they are, you know, almost perpetually being rained on. Even in the quote-unquote dry season, they'd be receiving, you know, I looked it up, they receive more rain than, I I, than we receive here in the Pacific Northwest during our wettest months. And that's during their dry months. Anthurium really don't ever want to be what we would ever consider dry. They do always want that access to water and that's gonna help you maintain lower leaves and the appearance of the lower leaves. Okay, next section is gonna be on fertilizers. This is, this is where things get a little bit controversial. I'm a pretty heavy fertilizer. So to anthurium people, that's an EC of 900. If you grow other things, you know, that's not that crazy. So for me, my fertilizer routine is a multi-part hydroponic fertilizer. Now I get a lot of people thinking that it's just a bunch of unnecessary parts, so let me explain why there's so many parts. The, the CalMag, the Micros, the Bloom component, and the Grow, it's just I haven't gotten the big one yet for this because I wasn't quite through it. Those four parts I just showed, you have to think of them as one part in a diluted fertilizer. So a lot of people I know use the Super Thrive, Foliage Pro or whatever it's called. Something like that is a one part, so it's gonna be more diluted and it might not necessarily have things in the same ratios or the same amount of CalMag is something like this where I'm adding it as well. But you have to think of these one parts as being equivalent to those four parts I just showed. They're doing four distinct things and together they make one complete fertilizer. And if you aren't in it for the blooms or whatever, maybe you don't need the bloom component. I am, however, I'm interested in flowering my anthurium and doing things with those flowers, so I'm always using the bloom component. Those four components make the core of your fertilizer routine. You don't want to use one without using all of the others. And anthurium especially, like quite a bit of CalMag. 
a lot of the sort of bleached out, deficient, not fully saturated foliage comes from a lack of CalMag. And that's simply because the plant needs CalMag to uptake the nitrogen, which it needs to make the chlorophyll. One step further back from that is the need for sulfur to take in the CalMag. So if you're using maybe something like a miracle Grow or one of these other fertilizers that doesn't have quite as comprehensive of, uh, of micros, you might find you are missing at one point in the nutrient uptake cycle, one of those things in sufficient quantities. And anthurium, that bottleneck is CalMag and sulfur. So supplementing the CalMag, supplementing the sulfur through a complete fertilizer that has really good micros, and then adding to it some kelp products. These are both high in iron and sulfur as well. So you need the sulfur to do the CalMag to do the nitrogen. And that's how you get really deep greens, is by fully having all these available. Also a lot of the other pigment um, compa uh, pigment compounds need these micro and trace nutrients. So by making sure you have a good micro through a nice complete fertilizer, for me it takes four parts because I'm buying it very constant, you get the complete nutrient needs of these anthurium and you'll have nice dark foliage. And like I was saying, I buy them concentrated and that's just because I go through a decent amount of nutrient solution each month, so cost effect, it wouldn't be very cost effective for me to buy um, like a diluted single part. It just works out a lot better for me to buy the hydroponic style where you're getting the liquid concentrates. You can go even one step further and actually get it as the powder that you then mix in to the liquid to then mix your nutrient solution, but I'm not quite there yet. I don't have that big of a growth setup. So like I was saying, you're going to want good sources of sulfur and iron for anthurium, and maybe you just want to step it up a little bit. Where I like to start is something like a Super Thrive, which is a vitamin supplement derived from kelp, and this Vitamax Pro, which is derived from fermented molasses and kelp. Uh, the reason I have two, Super Thrive is very, very expensive, but it, I've had such good results, I can't bring myself to fully switch to this, which is like one-tenth of the price. In order to get double up on the Super Thrive, I do, so I use about six mils for the five gallons, and I use 20 mils for the five gallons. And these, like I said, both are the this is just kelp, and this is kelp and molasses. And they both are great sources of sulfur and iron, as well as other, you know, more and complex nutrients. I also add diamond nectar, which is the humic and fulvic acid. This is great for building a healthy microbiome in your substrate, and it feeds a lot of good stuff, and it also provides some other things that allow your plants to uptake nutrients a little bit better. I like it, the thing, but it's definitely a product I use and have, you know, I have great results. So it's not something I'm looking to potentially eliminate from my nutrient regimen. Okay, and then the last part I use is the Orca, and this is the liquid myco and bacteria inoculant. So it has a, a few different types of mycorrhizal fungi and good bacteria. So these is, uh, you supplement with this and it helps build a healthy microbiome that can digest the nutrient solution and any sort of waste or ick in your root system. And it just makes sure that you're, you have, because if you don't have the good stuff, the bad stuff has a much easier time taking hold in your, in your root ball. So I like to do it. It also just, it digests the nutrient solution and makes it extra available for the plant. And then the fungi actually form a sympathetic, a sympathetic symbiotic relationship with the roots to uptake the nutrients in exchange for sugars. Mm -hmm. And one other thing to keep in mind is uh, a nice high quality hydroponic fertilizer is also going to accumulate salts at a much slower rate. And salts are just sort of excess nutrients that are because the plant doesn't take things up at the rate you're applying. And good, good fertilizers don't precipitate out as much salts. And another thing like I touched on earlier to keep in mind is since I'm growing these plants to flower and produce berries, I'm gonna have a lot more P and K than you might necessarily need in your in your um, solution at home. But I hope if you're here watching my anthurium video, you are interested in breeding your anthurium because it's just such a fun part of the anthurium hobby. Okay, and I know I touched on this earlier, but my EC is 900 and I keep my pH between 4.5 and 5. I like that range because the bad bacteria that causes root rot can't um, survive below a pH of 5, I believe. Um, also, it's within the recommended manufacturer pH range on my nutrient solution line. So it works out for um, more than one reason. So another thing is I keep my, I keep my nutrient solution 
between pHs of 4.5 and 5. That it, it falls within the manufacturer recommended range of the nutrient solution producer, first of all. And it, uh, at that lower pH, the harmful bacteria that causes root rot has a, uh, can't survive. So it has a harder time, you, have, uh, you reduce your risks of root rot at the low pH. An additional benefit of the low pH is it aids in the uptake of iron. Iron is especially useful in producing these dark and red pigments in anthurium. Next up, to my nutrient solution, I do add silica. Now with silica, there's two versions or formulas that are commonly sold. Potassium silicate, which I do not recommend, and this, which is monosilicic acid. So the monosilicic acid is the version of silica that is actually beneficial to the plants and is bioavailable. The potassium silicate is better used as pH up. It's not a good nutrient. So stay away from the potassium silicate and instead look for the monosilicic acid. Now another thing with silica is it is one of those things that can cause nutrient lockup and build up in your substrate if you're not being careful with it. However, I think the benefits of it far outweigh any sort of risk from that. And as long as you're not heavily fertilizing seedlings or smaller plants that aren't growing, you should not have too much of a risk for nutrient lockup, especially if you're regularly repotting a plant. If you're not doing that, definitely be flushing it with just pure filtered water. Now, the benefits to silica, a lot of people will say, maybe it doesn't do anything or they don't notice any benefit. I use this in every watering. It's a base component of my nutrient solution. If you're not using it, and before I used it, I had some issues with certain plants, especially the king of spades and the bessiaf, having very warped leaves. And after, one of the leaves were no longer warped. And there is, that is like a, a benefit of silica. Silica helps with the strengthening of cell walls and making sure that they, the cell walls are, you know, they're full proper shape. Now, another benefit of that is it makes the plant more resistant to stress and pests. So I definitely recommend silica for all of those benefits. Like I said, not essential, but if you're having a challenging anthurium, one of the things that could be missing is something as simple as silica, because again, it is an essential nutrient for these plants, and if they're not getting it from the substrate they're in or the fertilizer they're being fed, they have no way of you know, making it magically appear in the pot and it is an essential component. Okay, next I wanna talk about repotting, sort of the timing, the sizes, my approach to it. So I think to do it, I'm gonna go from seed up until full grown. So starting off with how I keep my anthurium seeds. So seeds off my own plants, I keep in these takeout containers, got them at Costco, um, and I just, you know, so a bunch of rows in them, and then they just grow. And then once they get to the point where I'm worried about them hitting the lid of the container, I transfer them either into the seedling tray like I showed earlier, or sometimes into these little square dessert pots. And this guy's just potted up in pawn. These guys were in the tree fern, perlite, and pumice mix. So this is sort of my smallest sized pot and I don't really like potting things into here. It's normally just when, for small things, I'm not looking to grow long-term. This is a little queen prop. This is a, a Papex Bess I made a few months ago. Alternatively, after going either from this or the seedling tray, I pot the seedling into one of my DIY wick pots. And this is just a little black 3.5 inch hydroponic net pot with some nylon rope that I've cut to be the wick. And then inside a 32 ounce food storage container. And then to make the net pot sit nicely into it, I cut a circle in the lid for the 32 ounce container. And that works to hold the net pot up by its lip. And yeah, so I pot the little seedling boys into here and they do great growing from little thing up like this all the way up to a huge plant like this. I mean, not huge, but <laughs> comparatively. And this plant I brought out as an example of what happens if you leave a plant under potted for too long. So you can see the leaf size of the last three leaves have really stalled out. And that's telling me 
it is root bound and really due for an up pot. So this is sort of the limit um, of a seedling grown to the size. You can get away with it if you started with a bigger leaf, obviously you could have a bigger plant, but this guy has more than rooted out this pot and is definitely ready to move into you know a pot like this which is more like a five inch yeah i'd probably estimate that five five and a half inch net pot from the three and a half inch net pot and these guys i know i showed them earlier but again this is another wick and reservoir pot these ones have an indicator i don't trust the indicators they lie I instead like to figure out how long it takes the individual plant to go dry. A plant like this definitely won't go dry in a month. A plant like this, with especially with the pot extender, you know, it's gonna be evaporating even more. It might go dry more like every three weeks. Uh, and in that case, I just top it up. A plant that's growing that fast, that is ripping through the reservoir, can definitely make do with a little bit of extra feed. Now I wanna talk about when to repot your plants. I'm a big believer in waiting in between leaves if the plant is delicate. If it's a pap, do whatever you want to it. It'll probably be fine. But some of these plants, if you repot them while they have an emergent, it can tank not only the emergent, but really the whole plant, um, especially if the roots don't really quickly and happily take to the new environment. So ideally wait between emergent leaves. I know that's not always possible. A lot of times when they're small and they're happy, the next leaf will start before the emergence has even finished hardening. In that case, once the leaf is you know full size and starting to harden that last you know week or two, that's when I would look to repot. And that's also again when I'd look to cut if I was looking to cut. And that's only on the plants that it's not possible to wait in between leaves. Now, like with anything, when it has the emergence, it's gonna be a lot more vulnerable to stress. So be careful, and I'm just explaining what I do. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. Do what works for you. And another thing with Anthurium, if you're doing them in self-watering especially, don't be afraid to really up-pot these plants. Now I'll put sometimes a pretty small plant into even one of these huge black net pots. And the reason I can do that, and the reason why you probably wouldn't want to do that if you were a, a non-self-watering grower, is the difficulty in keeping such a large pot moist enough for a small plant at the top to be able to survive in it. The advantage of the self-watering is it's consistently moist, so the little plant is able to establish in the big pot. And what I do is I just plant the plant deeper in the pot, and as it grows the stem, I just fill up the substrate with it. That works really good for, you know, the little plants that have enough petiole to make it over the edge. I find that's more of the limiting thing, making sure the plant has enough petiole length to reach over the lip of the pot. Now, I know I was talking about cuttings. Let's get back to cuttings. I also keep cuttings in pots like this. Here's a Wendy prop from my um, One Lingar video. You can see the new leaf. And it's actually working on another leaf already. But yeah, they work great for props too. Definitely recommend doing everything in soft watering. One of the nice things about props is you don't have to swap the reservoir until there's new growth. So what I usually do is with a prop that's not growing is I just, it gets the one reservoir when I take the cutting and then I wait, and when there's new growth or the new leaf, I finally give it a swap. So that means sometimes I don't have to water a propagation for, you know, two, three, four months. And that makes um, watering a lot easier. It really cuts down the amount of work you have to do when you can just set a plant and forget about it for several months until it's growing again. Because I know, like, a popular topic on YouTube right now is plant burnout. And I'd say, like, definitely the thing that has probably insulated me the most from plant burnout has to be the self-watering and knowing that if I want to, I could go, you know, two months without watering and most of my plants would probably be okay. Some obviously would not, or would be through the reservoirs too quickly, but by and large, especially my big plants in the black buckets would be totally fine for several months without any intervention, which just is, you know, such a weight off your shoulders if you're stressing about getting to uh, watering, you know, on a particularly hard week. It's nice to know you can just take a week off. Now let's talk about propagating. I know I touched a little bit on when I propagate. Let's talk about how one thing I would really recommend for smaller and more difficult propagations is getting yourself, um, you know, just a really like a, like a medical disposable razor. This came out of a, a high school biology dissection kit, but you can get them medical razors really anywhere. And they're nice, they're cheap, and they're disposable. 
I reuse them. It's not, I'm not doing surgery and I don't need a perfectly sharp one every time, but they will be significantly sharper than, you know, a kitchen knife or anything like that. And it works great for taking really small, delicate props. So I recommend, you know, if you're trying to remove a seedling butt or cutting in a very small, tight space using one of these razor blades, because you can cut right through the plant, no problem. Now, when you're propping an anthurium, let's, let's use this guy as an example, because it has a really nice, visible stem there. So you see where there's a little bit of gap between the root and you see the leaf connects into the stem. You're gonna to wanna to cut in between. Now on a plant that's as rooted as this, I could definitely take a cutting, you know, right up here up at the top, leaving behind just a couple of roots. But I always recommend leaving your top cut with at least a few healthy growing roots, no matter how low you have to go. And if you can't give it that, you probably shouldn't cut. Top cuts especially can go downhill really fast or take forever to recover if they don't have a good amount of root. And when I mean forever to recover, like a rootless little mid disc will have a new leaf and new growth before your top cut roots or bounces back. Like that's how bad it can be. Like I call it anthurium purgatory. So yeah, definitely make sure if you're taking a top cutting, leave it with some healthy growing roots. What I do once I've cut it and to make sure I prevent infections is I always disinfect my cutting implement, whether that's scissors or the razor blade or a box cut or whatever I use. I disinfect it with usually just rubbing alcohol or I wash it with soap and water. Reason I do that is to reduce the risks of rot. If it's a very sensitive plant, I will probably wash between each cut. Do I usually do that? No. What I, do, what I don't do is uh, chop off root rot, then use those scissors to cut the stem. I'd probably go get a fresh pair of scissors or again, wash them with soap and water. And that's just because I don't want to tempt fate. <laughs> After I take my cutting, what do I do? I use this gel. I don't think it's meant for aeroids. I use it because I have it. I'd probably look to do a powder instead next time just so it sticks to the wet wound. But I use this gel, let me go grab it. I just use this gel rooting hormone. And it has, you know, I think antibiotics and a fungicide in it. And I apply that to the cutting, you know, both sides. And I have it, I use it. I can't say that I have a 100% success rate with cuttings because, you know, I don't, but I have a pretty good, pretty good of keeping cuttings alive. I'm not gonna necessarily attribute it to this. I think the big thing is using a sharp, clean knife so that the wound isn't too, too rough for the plant. And then again, after I take my cutting, I like to give it as much humidity as I possibly can because this plant has now lost its, you know, its healthy established roots for uptaking that moisture. So if you have a hardy anthurium, totally good to just probably take those cuttings, throw them in the tent, maybe even ambient, I wouldn't do it, but definitely tent or bin. Bin for the ones that, you know, are either rootless or have a lot of foliage, very little root, but sometimes that's not an option. And in those cases, I do just do it in the tent. You know, a good example would be if you take a top cutting off of one of these huge plants here, you obviously can't put it in the bin, but a plant like that is pretty, gonna be pretty okay, bouncing back in the net pot in the tent. And that's because the net pot provides it with the constant source of moisture. Again, another advantage to the self-watering, cuttings establish really well and really easily with a high success rate in that constantly moist environment that the wick provides. And a little bit about substrates. I mean, I, I put my cuttings into either my pond, my aeroid mix, or the tree fern pumice perlite mix. I think the big thing is if the mix stays airy, which all my mixes do, so they're all fine for rooting and recovering cuttings in. It's just a matter of personal preference at that point. Okay, last thing I think I'm gonna talk about is the hybridization process and what the tools I use to do that are. Now, first off, I wanna talk about this quickly so I can put it back in the freezer. And that's gonna be where I store all my pollen. So what I do is I just have a big Ziploc, I guess that's in my freezer. And in it, I keep all these little tubes. These are called Eppendorf tubes. And what I do is I, I really don't know if I'm gonna be able to show this on camera, just with how fine it is, but I write in Sharpie the species, you know, which species it obviously, which specimen it is in my collection. So this says Carla 510, and then the date. Um, and that's just so I know how old the pollen is. I'm gonna quickly put these back in the fridge. 
uh, in the fridge, in the freezer, and I'll get back to talking about the pollinating process. Like I was saying, I get these Eppendorf tubes off of Amazon, along with these just really cheap disposable paint brushes. And now to collect the pollen, all you have to do is, so it's saying to collect the pollen, all you have to do is place the tin foil under and just gently brush the inflorescence and onto the tin foil you'll collect all your pollen. I don't know how visible it'll be on camera, but to my eye right now I can see quite a bit of pollen collecting here. And what I like to do, fold the tin foil. What I would then do is gently brush into the Eppendorf tube all of that pollen. I can't really do this on camera that easily. You know, it looks something like this. Normally wouldn't do it quite so brazenly, but you know, all it takes is brushing that pollen in. And then all I do is write, you know, in this case, BVEP and today's date, so Friday the 13th. So once you've collected some of your own pollen, you can obviously go about pollinating your anthurium. Now, I don't have one that will be visibly receptive, but I did take a good photo recently of actually that flower I just collected pollen from um, when it was receptive. So I'll show that here. And when you see that stigmatic fluid, so that's what the little bit of the little water droplets you're seeing on the tip of the flowers. So it's actually a compound flower. Each of those little nub, nubbins is what I like to call them are the individual flowers, and each one will produce stigmatic fluid at the tip. Sometimes the anthurium don't have as pronounced, they're instead internal. And then in that case, in the little divots is where you'll see the stigmatic fluid. And when you see that, that means the anthurium is receptive, so you can apply pollen. Now here's where it gets a little bit complicated. The, the, the hybridization process is easy. Knowing which plants are gonna be compatible is the hard part. And here's where it gets even more confusing. They're essentially all compatible if you're willing to try enough times and you're patient enough. Now that's, they're not all compatible. Let me just make that clear. And especially geographically separated plants and plants from different sections will have a harder time. I just don't wanna say anything can't be done because weirder crosses have been done and will be done. And it seems like just about all of them, if they're capable are of, hybrid, uh, of making babies are able to hybridize. It's, it's remarkable, it's very, it's so interesting about Anthurium is the ease and variety of which you can hybridize. So definitely don't be dissuaded um, if it doesn't work out a couple times. You know, I've, I've tried some hybrids, you know, three, four, or five times um, before I had success. And like I was saying, when it's receptive, you apply the pollen and then in two to 14 months, depending on the species, you will get berries with seeds. I wish I had a plant that was berrying right now, I don't. But I can show you pictures of what the berries look like and it's so easy, you just pluck them right off and squeeze them and a little seed will pop out. And then around that seed there is an endocarp, which I recommend you soak and they puff up and they fall off very easily. And after that, like I showed earlier, you just can sow them in a tray or in cups, whatever you wanna do, and you'll get little seedlings pretty quickly. Yeah, all in all, I'd say definitely it is such a worthwhile and rewarding process to do, and Anthurium make it really easy. Yeah, so I'd say I think that just about covers like my Anthurium care and knowledge 101. I really, I, you know, I get a lot of questions about how I grow, what I do, so I wanted to try to answer all of my like frequently asked questions in one video and do like my sort of over my guide to Anthurium. So we can call this that. I really appreciate you guys watching to the end. You know, if you have any comments, questions, please leave them down below. Give me a like, make sure you're subscribed. I will see you next time. Thanks again. Now, if you're still here, I think I'm gonna introduce the kitten you've been seeing probably throughout the video intermittently as it's been terrorizing both me, my laptop, and the plants. So let me grab him. This is Charlie. He's a, ooh, I think 13 weeks old now. He's a male ragdoll. We've had him for just over a week. So he started to settle in and turned into a little terror. He's a great little kitty, very friendly. I'll be showing lots more of him on the channel, I'm sure. Figured I'd introduce him here. I already showed him on the Instagram, but here's our little dude. Bye for real next time. <laughs>